you ready? Now, for Hail Wildcats Radio on the Cat Eye Network. Coming at you from the 1380 WELE, the Cat Studios in Daytona Beach, Florida, this is Hail Wildcats Radio, the official Bethune-Cookman University sports show. This is episode one. Hello and a very warm welcome. My name is Michael Trillo, the voice of the Wildcats, play-by-play broadcaster on 1380 WELE and the Cat Eye Network Radio. And each week, I'll be taking you through all the news, notes, and happenings around Bethune-Cookman athletics. But I'm not alone. I've got two distinguished panelists with with me are SIDs at Bethune Cookman University. So let's go around the table, explain who you are and uh, what you mean to BCU Athletics. I'm Brian Harvey, Assistant Communications Director. Happy to be here, Mike. And I just do whatever my boss tells me to do. And I'm going to let him introduce himself right now. And and uh, and hopefully I didn't do a bad job. <laughs> don't, don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. <laughs> I'm uh, Bryce Wynoski. I'm the Director of Athletic Communications uh, here at BCU. Been here since 2021. Uh, and we're excited. Uh, we're excited to be here, excited to be trying something new here with the Cat Eye Network. Uh, I know you guys have heard Mike a lot uh, on, on our games, being very uh, objective, very to the point, talking about the game. We're going to try to squeeze some opinions out of him. I, I feel like it may be just a little bit more facilitation from him, but mm. we're going we're to see what we can do. We're going to see what we can do. It's exciting. On this special episode, this is the first of our two off-season episodes, so the the pattern of weekly episodes is not really going to start until we get into sports season in a couple weeks today we're going to go through the 2023-2024 wildcats season in review we're going to tackle out all the sports go in chronological order from fall all the way to spring and get you caught up on everything that's going on around bcu athletics let's start in the fall sports and we'll talk about volleyball volleyball going to start up i think what 12 days from now is the first volleyball game but let's go back to last year uh five and six at home but one and eight on the road made the tournament, uh, but lost to Alabama State in the quarterfinals. But Nyara Hightower, I'm so glad she's back this year. Uh, led the SWAC in blocks with 107 and was the SWAC blocker of the year and all SWAC second team. Yeah, it's she's an incredible player. And and whatever we can say about the program, the success or or the lack of maybe last season, they are a block factory. Uh, head coach Brittany Williams recruits her butt off when it comes to protecting the front of the net. Nyara Hightower, just another name in a long line of especially recent Wildcats who've come through and just dominated up front. Well-deserved blocker of the year. We're excited to see if she can put up some historic program numbers again this year, just with another year under her belt in the program. She's really taken that leadership role defensively for these Wildcats, and, and just overall, she's she's a voice for the team. She's fantastic. It's going to be exciting to watch her again this year. I think it was is important that, that you have someone like Niara Hightower here because she's back, she's got the accolades, but you got a person like Kittal Price, and I think that's going to be kind of the X factor. She she's back for what a fifth sixth seventh season now i mean she's <laughs> yep. you know we we've stopped counting but her leadership there is is one that can't be overstated she brings so much uh, a wealth of knowledge to the game uh just her experience and and also that kind of voice of hey let's lock in let's get loaded now um i, I do believe that there's going to be another key factor in that and that's being able to have your setter back mike and that's alicia calendar uh Nyara might have the blocks but she also has kills and the setups were there from alicia calendar and i think that's going to be one of the glues there she's the quarterback of the team and we talk a lot about this but you see the one and eight road record but a lot of that is we're going on the road playing some top teams we played a lot of good teams from around the southeast in the non-conference schedule to get ready for that swag schedule and coach williams does a great job scheduling those teams yeah. making sure her team is prepared so when we do get to the swag we can consistently make the swag turn i think we haven't missed one since we've came over from the MIAC four years ago. Yeah, it's 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 big, Mike. You talk about the schedules, and, and you look at this year's schedule, it's no different. You got the Bash at the Beach, but last year at home, you had Manhattan come in. I mean, excuse me, you had um, Citadel. Uh, Marshall, uh, Citadel. You got some really good teams come in, and uh, I know Marshall had a, a, their head coach was uh, someone that had a good recruiting class, so they were expecting big things in, in their league. And this year, you got uh, you, you got another powerful schedule. They're going to Tulsa. You know, that's another strong tournament out there. So again, she doesn't shy away from competition, and it does get you ready for the swag. It does get you ready for those tough games on the road, Bryce. You know, it's it's, it's one of those things to where you got to be the best, you got to play the best. NCAA volleyball is really interesting in the last couple of years, too, because I think we've seen some big-time separation between the top level of, of what it takes to be a dominant program nationally. Mm. And so it makes these preseason, uh, or should say early season tournaments, that much more difficult and that much more of a measuring stick for your team because you're just playing such tough competition that's going to demand the very best out of you. If you're Coach Brittany Williams and the Wildcats, you have to worry a little bit about kind of the 
discouragement that comes with starting a little yeah. rough, which which we all, you know, players, coaches, us as staff, we all see coming. I mean, it's really difficult to start no matter what team you are to play those kind of schedules. You want to make sure that it doesn't leak into that SWAC schedule. You don't want right. to be too worried about, oh, man, we've struggled, we've struggled, we haven't been where we think we should be, we haven't quite competed at the level we want to. You take the little things, those, those team-building moments, whether it's in the locker room, whether it's on the court, working on your plays, working with each other, you take that, you move it into the SWAC, mm. you can't let that record bog you down a little bit. One of the things we have to talk about with volleyball, and I'm sure we'll repeat this ad nauseum throughout the season, is the home court advantage at Moore Gymnasium is one of the most unique in the country for volleyball because that ceiling is so low. Mm -hmm. It's an old gym. Balls get caught up in those rafters all the time. And maybe that's why, or not why, but one of the reasons you see such a good home record for the Wildcats. Yeah, no doubt about it, Mike. I think we know how to play it. And it, 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 it it's, it's cliche to say, oh, we're at home. We know our gym. No, we know our gym because, like you said, Mike, the ceiling is low. You have to be able to play it. We know if that ball bounces off the trajectory that it's going to take and, and fall in this area, you know, we know how to serve not too high. You know, it's... It's, it's one of those things where this home court advantage is unlike any other. You know, it's it, it has difficulties there, but again, the atmosphere there. When we actually get fans in there and they pack it, it's loud. They're right on top of you, just like basketball, which we'll talk about later. The atmosphere there is unlike any other in the SWAC because they have arenas, you know, more so. Uh, mo most for volleyball, you know, they're, they're at bigger stadiums. So uh, it, it's one of those things to where our atmosphere, the team feeds off of that, Bryce, and I think that's kind of one of the biggest things and, and the reason why our home record is much better than it is on the road. And as much as you want to give a, a well-due credit to the team for playing so well at home, that road record is going to have to improve yeah. if we really want to take that next step, get better seating, avoid some of the top teams in the SWAC once you get to that tournament, is you're going to have to win more games on the road. And, and obviously the non-conference tournaments are one thing, but when you're going to places like Mississippi Valley State, Jackson State, uh, some of these others really early in yeah. conference play, you want to try to take care of business it's it's been a really tough spot for the wildcats in recent years it, it has to change and now this year is a little different scheduling wise you don't have the clusters right. anymore right. within the conference it used to be you would go out to say jackson state you'd play three or four different teams to kind of knock out scheduling quickly well now you're just going to home sites so you're going to get a bunch of different atmospheres you're going to go to more places throughout the year more travel more miles underneath mm -hmm. you it's going to be a little bit of a different look and and you hope that they can use that as a way to kind of flip the script on what that road record has been in recent years you you said it right there, that road record right there, but also it's it's big. There's turnover this year. There's there's turnover. So you look at Jackson State, their coach retired uh, after a long, long time. She'd been there forever. They won the tournament on the, on the heels of her announcing that just the day before the start of the tournament. Uh, you, you also look at Mississippi Valley, where the turnover rate there is huge. Alcorn, second-year head coach, but not a lot going there. So we've got, these are games you must win on the road. These are matches you must win on the road, like you said, Bryce. So there's turnover there, and there's a chance to pick up some road wins. And I think it's important you talk about the veterans on the team, Alicia Callender, Niara Hightower, they've been here, done that. Yeah. So they've got a chance to do that. They've got a chance to improve on that this year. Absolutely. Let's move on and talk football, because I'm, I'm mm. sure we might spend a little bit of time on football. Football went 3-8 uh, and eight overall and 2-6 and six in the SWAC, but I, I think there's a lot of context there. First off, first year head coach Raymond Woody coming home to the place where he was a player, an a All-American linebacker here at Bethune-Cookman, now over the reins as the coach and I think the improvement from week one to week 12 of the season really implies that the program is in a good direction no matter what the record says. There's there's no doubt about it. Bryce, take this. You saw him every week. You were on the road with him. Like Mike said, and Mike was there with you, what was it? Well, w when you bring in a new coach and he comes in after National Signing Day, the roster's not going to be your bragging point. You're not going to say, we've got all these guys, we've got the talent where we want it to be, because you just might not. And so a lot of holdovers, a lot of guys uh, who, who've stuck through a lot, and, and credit to all those guys who've been there through the transition as, as rocky as it may have been so when when that's the case you look to the coach and the coach is your team and you don't have that star player you don't have these guys as great as guys like Omari Hill Robinson were uh, your coach is your your flagship and, and coach Woody really was uh, I think his debut was as good as it could have been with all the circumstances and you see that I think number one in 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 the trenches when it came to defensively I mean that's a team that, that that's a unit that thrives off of coaching as much as it does talent you know it, it you you love having your guys on the edge your guys in the secondary who can be those playmakers but they just took care of business in the little things I mean they were the fewest penalized team in right. the history right. of the program both in yards per uh, penalty 
yards per game and just total penalties. That is 100% coaching. And if you lay that foundation now of doing those little things right, when you bring in the players that might have some egos, have some talent, all that stuff, you've already put that in place. If they improve that this year with that extra bump of talent, you're going to see a lot of these one-score games, which we had so many of this year, flip the other way. You talk about one-score games, right? Jackson State, 22-16. Alabama State, 19-14. Texas Southern, 34-31. Southern, 28-18. Those are four games all within 10 points right. that the defense kept you in it, but the offense maybe wasn't there. And, of course, going through four quarterbacks in a season because of injuries, five quarterbacks at, at some points, is it, not going to help your offensive consistency. But I think Coach Garbino did a good job with the hand he was dealt, and especially the last couple of games. We went 2-1 and one in the last three games, including blowing out Alabama State in our last home game. So confidence on that side moving forward as well. I think Garbino did what he was expected to do. You, you know, Bryce already talked about the defense. That's that's going to be there because Coach Wood is a defensive guy. He knows that side of the ball. You had to bring in an OC that you trust and an OC that's going to, you know, bring in something new in a packages that that you have. You have players that are going to have to fit into these packages. He did what he was expected to do. do are you really going to run five wide sets and a lot of pass plays when your quarterback is kind of a converted quarterback and then you, you got injuries to the quarterback position? You're not going to put a lot on film so that coaches for next year can scout when you get that quarterback in and those receivers in to run those plays. So he did exactly what he was expected to do. You, you run some basic stuff and a lot of the basic stuff, the talent we had was able to convert that into yards, convert that into points. You just sustain drives. I think that's going to be the biggest thing. You want to be able to sustain drives. We can't have the three and outs. We can't have the get a first down, turn the ball over. It's got to be sustaining drives, holding the ball, controlling the clock. And I think Garino did a, a good job of that last year. This year it's going to be, okay, how do you improve upon that? And now, now he has his guys in. Now we're going to see the real Coach Garbino offense. It's fun, too, because that Alabama A&M game, the, the final home game of the season, the last win for the Wildcats, it it really felt like a jumping off point. Yeah. Like there was a there was a moment in the first half where it kind of felt like it was a little bit more of the same. You know, you win the half down seven and you come back out and you score 24 unanswered points. And it really felt like you were running all over them. It was the first time that offense really looked consistent, dominant run game. And it really felt like heading into the Classic the next weekend, there was real talk from us, from fans, like, are we going to scare Florida a m here? Are we going to give them a chance? I mean, I don't know how many people would sit around and say, we're favored, we should win, all this stuff. But it, there was some buzz there. And if you can take that, you carry that into this year, I think the biggest thing is going to be protecting the quarterbacks because you've got a group now, guys, that that can do it, that have the talent. Luke Sprague, your, your returner, who I think will probably uh, get a lot of action early. Uh, that remains to be seen. But if you can protect him, keep him healthy, you give Coach Gramino a real chance to build that offense instead of kind of trying to adapt week to week about who, who's throwing the ball, mm -hmm. who do I have available to me, what's the line going to look like. You take that and you run with it, and there could be a real spark offensively this year. I mean, the Florida Classic as well, right? You look at the final score, 24-7. to 7. 24 was the fewest points that Florida a &M scored all year, mm -hmm. and it's a, a credit to our defense that we kept that game close up until the final minutes. You were able to control a guy like Jeremy Musa, I mean, who's, you know, absolutely a, a breakout guy at Florida a &M, But just look at what you were able to do. You're able to, like you said, Mike, the weapons they had on that offense, that offense was sick. They had some nasty weapons out there, and you were able to control that and keep them contained. Now, you're, you're never going to be able to stop it. No, and that, that wasn't going to happen. You were hoping to contain it. You got exactly what you, you what you wanted out of that. And, Bryce, in the end, you kept it close, and I think a lot closer than anybody ever expected. Yeah, no doubt. It, it, big time momentum point. I you talk about those last two games. It really felt like a very, very different team than I think anybody expected. I think that we thought coming out of the gate uh, that they looked like, and it, it's going to be their job now to carry that over. Really tough start to this season's schedule. You've got to, like we talk about with volleyball, you've got to stay on it. You've got to show yourself something. Don't worry about what we as media, as fans, whatever else think. They, this team has to show themselves something. So keep consistent on defense. Keep doing what you're doing. Stay disciplined. You have to stay disciplined. That cannot go away if they're going to be successful this year. And then you try to see what you can figure out on offense. It might take some time, but again, round into form for swag and then let's roll. Let's move to the hardwood. Start with women's basketball. 15 and 16 last year. Ended up 6 and 12 in the conference. And this was a team at the beginning of the season, Bryce, I came to you and I said, this may be the team that gets us there. 
and it it just didn't end up being that way. Uh, kind of faded down the stretch. But look at that non-conference schedule. Wins over Iona, Georgia State, Jacksonville, Bradley. We were so confident going into conference play and then just went 1-7 and seven down the stretch and ended up missing the conference tournament on the last day by, by one game. Yeah, there was the Iona game in the non-conference, that big overtime win at home, one that kind of felt like it was slip, slipping away. The Wildcats came back and stole. The Mercer game won at the buzzer by Chanel Wilson, who the Wildcats are going to miss dearly this year but you're absolutely right i mean it felt like this team this team is is legit and they they started off uh, okay in conference play kind of battled back and forth you know you beat fam on opening day uh, there's a couple of other wins early and and then the injury started chanel wilson banged up uh, for a lot uh, a long time uh, chanel mcdonald another great player who was who was banged up from here to here they could never really get it all put together at the same time it was it was really tough it really testing a team that that had it all in front of them early in the season and it's a very new team this year they're missing some of those pieces so it's going to be interesting to see how you take that how you learn to play without some of your your pillar players coming into this year i think you, you said it Bryce. the injuries is what hurt the injuries absolutely decimated them during that five game swing where at one point they only had seven players and we're talking about in no disrespect we're talking about gabby stevens and cherry johnson were were two players that were available who had limited minutes last year because they were young you know they they really didn't know what was going on they were trying to fit in there so really you had five players that they were they were using you looked at kayla white and and uh, it was Kayla White and then I believe it was Chanel to where you they didn't come off the court. That was Deshante. Didn't come off the court. Now you're missing Chanel Wilson. You're missing Deshante Edwards, who, who transferred with, within the conference and the transfer portal. But you've got to now find, what is it, Bryce, about 40 points? You've got to try to find that and some rebounds. So it, this is going to be this is going to be a massive swing. But uh, I, I think that when you look at what Janelle Creighton's been able to do, Coach Creighton is a recruiter. She's someone that, that brings in, they plug in, they play. I think now with the transfer portal, they got a couple kids coming in through the transfer portal. You lost some, you gained some. Transfer portal, hey, you know, they'll give it, they'll, they'll take it the way. It, it works both ways, that door. So if if she brings in what we believe she's able to bring in, I think they'll be okay. And again, Mike, you said this could be the team that takes a step. I'm believing it this year. This could be the team that takes a step. And I want to talk about Kayla Clark as well. Again, another player that had some injury problems but I think now with a couple of players graduating out in Jackson State, maybe being a little bit lower power mm -hmm. level than they have been in the past, Kayla Clark could be a player, if she plays to her full potential, could be center of the year in the SWAC. She's got that level of talent. No doubt about it, and and, and I, I believe that. You talk about Zay Green's gone from, from Arkansas Pine Bluff. Uh, Alabama State lost their guard. You look at... Uh, Prairie View, they're they're missing some people. Yeah. No it's, Angel Jackson. And no Angel Jackson. The, the Jackson State's they're they're losing players, and and obviously with Coach Reed leaving Jackson State, that's a huge hole that they needed to fill. So the recruiting ain't, ain't going to be there. You would think, and that's no disrespect to to who's coming in, but the recruiting's going to take a little bit of a dip. It's it, it's just needless to say. But I think Kayla Clark could be that center of the league. Mike, she, she's got that kind of talent. How many double-doubles last year was ridiculous. And again, missing games. So if she plays to her potential, she could be center of the year. And I think part of the, the struggle for the Wildcats last year is the size issue, especially mm. with Jackson State. I mean, as, as far as women's basketball is concerned, a, a giant team within this conference. Just bigs everywhere, a lot of size, a lot of length. And, and Kayla Clark dominates against a lot of other teams, but then when you're matched up with these trees in the, in the post, it's it's tougher. It's a harder place to succeed, especially when she was carrying that load a lot alone when Chanel McDonald missed time or when some others were banged up. Not the biggest guard group in the world as far as size-wise last year, so they, they, they lacked a little bit of that. But I think with Coach Creighton, she's a very defensive first head coach, and we saw that especially in her first year when she didn't have a lot of talent, a lot of scheming up defensively. Uh, they sell out for the ball a lot, go for those 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 lanes, try to get those steals, which, which costs them at times, yeah. but they're going to be built off the defense, and that's something that I think we should have no no lack of confidence that coach Creighton can instill in no no matter what class comes in and i think when you have kayla clark anchoring that being that that go point i think it's going to be a really easy transition let's talk men's basketball now record 17 and 17 11 and 7 in the SWAC, positive conference record. And this men's basketball team, especially down the stretch in conference play, was one of the stories of the year on campus in terms of the entire athletic department. Getting to the SWAC tournament, winning their first ever SWAC tournament game against Southern, getting to the postseason for the second time in program history, almost upsetting Arkansas State, a team that had almost beaten James Madison 
five days earlier, a team that went on to the second round of the NCAA tournament. So I think there was a ton of hype behind this men's basketball team. And you saw it with big crowds, packed out more gymnasium, packed out the Ocean Center for the CBI. Just talk about this men's basketball team. I think they were a very modern basketball team. You know, they were anchored by really top-end talent. I mean, Jacoby Hetty, Zion Harmon, and to, to a little bit of a lesser extent, Deshaun Dyson, just fantastic scorers, uh, big-name guys. I mean, you got two guys who transferred out into other programs, moving on up in that hierarchy now with the transfer portal. But, man, did they put in work when they were here. That that Zion Harmon-Jacoby Hetty connection, you could see it in their eyes every game. The, the lobs, the, the flashy plays, the... So many, you know, top 10 uh, sports center type moments from those two. The chemistry was was fantastic. They were fun to watch. I mean, and I say modern, a lot of iso ball, a lot of just looking to go to the hoop. Um, they moved the ball pretty well, but sometimes they would get bogged down a little bit uh, in, in that kind of uh, just, just get my shot type of mentality. But it worked out. I mean, they were really exciting to watch. And with an atmosphere like more gymnasium, where people are just ready to explode at any moment with those highlight plays, it was so much fun. And, and I think with the way the game continues, continues to evolve that that kind of team can find a lot of success nowadays. I think you're right, Bryce. It, it, the atmosphere was was fantastic. None more than the Alcorn State game where it was TV. It was displayed for everyone to see. I mean, you you guys, you you looked at it, Mike, you were on air. What were the numbers? The numbers were phenomenal. The engagement was huge. You, you talk about people were saying, wow, is this kind of atmosphere they have? Yeah, every game at more gym. We already talked about the atmosphere there. But you also looked at, Bryce, you said perfectly, the Zion Harmon, Jacoby Hetty duo. That was filthy. That was something that, that you could look at every day and say, well, there's about 30-some points right there. You know, you just added it up. Then you added the athleticism of a newcomer like Beverly. You know, Reggie was with uh, Reggie Ward, excuse me, Reggie Ward. You have someone like Reggie Ward that was just an absolute athlete. Backdoor dunks, lobs, you know, it was the excitement that built that gym. And, and like you said, every dunk, the place is ready to explode. Now, you have to find something different. You know, you got to find something different now because it's going to be it's going to be different without those two at the top. Um, you, you have to find what's your game going to be. You know, it's it's going to be more lobs. Is it going to be more uh, pounded inside now? Is it going to be the wings are going to be expected to, to kind of kick in and drive the baseline? What's your game going to be now? Because you're losing 30 some points a game there. So you got to find out real quick. But no doubt, Coach Theus is going to be able to bring in guys. That's what he does. He's a name. He's a he's a he's a guy that's been there and done that. So you, you look at him and, and a new staff, Mike. You know, you, you I know you didn't touch on that. There's a new staff. So everything about men's basketball seems new this year. So I'm excited. I want to see what it's going to be. Three and O oh in overtime. That stat alone just kind of defined yeah. how the men's basketball team played their games. So many close games, whether they were on top or on the bottom of those games. But at 3-0 and oh in overtime, especially two of the last four, on the road at Florida A&M last game of the season, punching their ticket to the SWAG tournament in overtime against your arch rivals. Like, that is something you can't really teach, that kind of clutch gene. It's something that develops within a program over time. And I think Coach Theus, through his first couple seasons at the helm, has kind of developed that mentality about his players. And he had some guys, Deshaun Dyson, felt like Mr. Clutch in his time here. I mean, how many buzzer beaters, how many big-time shots did we see from him? A guy that wanted the ball in those moments that said, give it to me. This is my time. It, it was fantastic. Don't underestimate the loss of a guy like that. And not to mention defensively. I mean, that's how you get back in games like that, is you have a guy like Damani McIntyre, who for his first couple years here, I, I personally sold myself into thinking, man, if he could develop a three-point shot, that is an NBA-level defensive player. I mean, he had the instincts. Coach Theus talked about it many times as a guy who plays defense better than hardly anyone he's seen at any level. And Coach Theus, old-school basketball guy, defensive-first basketball guy, coaches his team like that. You don't get minutes if you don't play defense. And a Coach Theus staff and I think we need to see that carry over. I, I think the biggest thing for me going into this season is the center position has been a revolving door for these Wildcats since Coach Theus has been here. Just haven't really found a guy that has been that lockdown spot uh, to this point. Uh, James Henderson Jr. last year, Elijah Holse, they both left the program. Mm -hmm. uh, solid minutes, but never really kind of emerged as that go-to guy. And there's a lot of size in this league, so it'll be interesting to see where they find to fill that hole for these coming seasons. I like to go on not even overtime. Mike, there were a couple games that, uh, that were just absolutely thrillers down there was it the which game was it mike well you have one of your greatest calls where uh was it deshaun had the steal yep. and the shot on the alabama baseline man. alabama man. That, that's fantastic yeah. i mean you, you talk about the 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 games down the stretch they were poised who's going to be that now you know you, you have to find that that senior leader without being a senior now who's going to be able to supply those moments and i think that's that's one of the question marks we talk about zion Harmon, jacoby hetty they got the the accolades zion Harmon, all swag first team jacoby mm -hmm. hetty all swag second team but i also want to shout out deshaun dyson who was selected to the uh, hbcu all-star game at the uh, nba 
All-Star Week and was the MVP of that game, leading scorer, draining threes from all over the court, looked like a prime Steph Curry out there. And uh, I, I think Deshaun and Chanel Wilson from the women's team have a couple opportunities this summer to go and uh, explore some next-level basketball. We'll talk about that on next week's show. We talk about specifically the off-season uh, recap for the Wildcats. But that's men's basketball. Great season for, for men's basketball and, and reason to uh, be optimistic going forward. I'm optimistic. Let's go. <laughs> Let's go to the spring sports and talk about softball softball ended up 20 and 32 but again 16 and 8 in swag play number three seed in the east the wildcats always up there in the softball diamond coach watton has her team well drilled uh non-conference wins against illinois state and north dakota that illinois state game first game of the season yeah. kind of shocked us they were over at the the tampa tournament with usf and they got that win and we all thought whoa here, here we go and it didn't really hit those heights again until conference play right. but there were flashes of how great this team could be no doubt about it mike and, and bryce touched on it early with volleyball and, and some other sports where you can't get down same thing with football softball is one of those one of those sports as well the schedule is brutal it's tough she does not shy away from anyone coach Watton has always put in a schedule that you say you're playing them you're going to this tournament you're going here she plays everyone and they could easily start one in 15 one in 16 they went through that stretch after beating illinois state where i think we lost the next 15 in a row if i'm not mistaken so you look at it and the girls could get down they never did a lot of those games were one and two run games michigan was a two run game at, at, at one point so you're talking about oregon state you played them twice that was a team that had a lot of accolades in the pac-12 you know, r.i.p to, to the pac-12 they had a lot of accolades going into that season their pitcher was if i'm not mistaken she was like second team all pac-12 so we faced her in one of those games at tampa it was a one run game at, at, at one point going into it so the offense has got to be able to to deliver a little bit better um, in, in helping Haleen out, but the schedule's brutal, and they have to be able to keep their heads up when going through tough schedules like that, and then it gets you ready for the swag where, Mike, you already alluded to it, in the swag, we're going to be. We're going to be with them, Cookman. They're, they're going to dominate. Yeah, in, in many ways, softball the last handful of years has been a very formulaic season. You know, you, you, you make your way through a really tough non-conference, and then it's just wake me up when the swag tournament starts, because you don't learn a whole lot uh, necessarily, because it just feels like you kind of walk through a lot of the swag. I mean, I mean, they, they dominate in the regular season when you have a top-end starting pitcher like Haleen Gonzalez, who's going out there two or three times a weekend and just shoving bats. Yeah. It's, it's such a luxury that not many programs in this conference have and coach Watton's one who's recruited pitching so well especially in that turnover to the SWAC and it's it's really been fantastic to have that but again you talk about the offense has to take that next step it's been a very you know slap first team that's kind of come back to bite them a little bit when you get to the SWAC tournament they've, they've won at least a game and last year they won two since they've been in the SWAC and into the tournament but it always just kind of feels like the offense struggles to find its way a little bit once we get there so again you know we, we take what you can out of that out of that SWAC schedule you you do your job it's it's the offense that's going to have to pick it up but we're also expecting a, another really stellar season on the mound it's it's just been what we're used to around here now I want to talk about Haleen Gonzalez, an iron woman in the circle. Led the SWAC in innings pitched, 213 and two-thirds innings pitched on this <laughs> season. All SWAC second team for her. But you, And you talk about the offense, Bryce. Players like Sierra Clark may be what the Wildcats need. Sierra Clark, all SWAC first team. Lead, led the team in average, OPS, runs, hits. Someone who was always dependable, could always get a clutch hit late in the game. The Wildcats just didn't have enough of those type of moments on the season, especially coming down late in the tournament when they, uh, they lost to Alabama State. And it's not to say they're not capable of it. I mean, they came out, you talk about that transition from non-conference to swag play. Well, they left no doubt that it didn't affect them last year because you go to Mississippi Valley and it's 11 runs, 16 runs, 8 runs. I mean, you're capable of putting it up, just maybe not necessarily against the caliber of pitching that you might see in the first game of a tournament. So they, they've got some bats, they've got some great leaders who've been a part of this program for, for a long time who know what it takes, who know where they should be. It's just a matter of kind of getting over that hump and, and being there. And I know uh, the the coaching staff there with the Wildcats has worked really hard, really closely uh, with the hitters to try to get them to where they need to be. No doubt about it. And, and last year was kind of the changing of the guard a little bit in, in its swag. You know, Prairie View wasn't the champ, and Prairie View is a power team. You look at a lot of the teams in the West as power. Well, last year it was kind of speed, and that's what Coach Watton has has always had on the base path. You look at Jocelyn Davis, and, and you look at Jessica Alwan and, and Thais Uyima. A lot of the 
kind of shiftier players out there, Shania Owens, stealing bases, getting on, stealing bases. That's what they have to do, but the offense has to come through. You've got to be able to bunt them over. You've got to be able to get a slap hit to go through the side and, and move those runners in. And last year was Jackson State, fam. You've got teams that are traditionally get on the base pass, steal bases, bunt them over, score. That was the change in the guard last year. The power game, Texas Southern, UAPB, uh, Prairie View, that didn't do it. You know, we, we kind of upset those teams in, in, over here in the East, and that was the, the new age. So you're wondering, is that going to be again this year, or are we going to have to add in some power and kind of mix it up a little bit more, or is the SWAC kind of moving towards that that speed first conference? We don't know. We'll see. Before we close out talking about baseball, and I know Bryce and I have a lot to say about baseball, uh, <laughs> let's talk about some of the individual sports. We'll start with golf and maybe the high point for the entire athletic department of the entire year. Katie Robinson, a SWAC golf champion on an individual on the team got second place yeah me and brian both made that trip really fun group man it that that program is is it's been impressive to say the least of coming from a spot just a couple of years ago we're still trying to look for a coach still trying to put a program together still trying to kind of emerge from that covid layoff that a transition to a new league and and they've come out firing you know coach harry's whole strategy has kind of just been to find the best team in the swack and your best player is going to come over and play for me <laughs> and so that's how it worked with Katie Robinson, you know, Bama State, uh, she she played very well over there for a handful of years, and, and she took her game to the next level this year. Uh, a lead-by-example type of player, you know, she's not going to be the in-your-face doing that sort of thing. Not that golf is that kind of sport, uh, but she goes out there and she takes care of business, and she did it this year. It was a lot of fun to see, and, and it was a lot of fun to see her teammates get behind her as she went on to win the individual title. Nobody got to be closer with this team than I did last year with with having to travel with them and then having to actually coach a, a day. I have a coaching record. Yeah, thank you. What, what is that record? Brad? It was a record. So, <laughs> so uh, it, it was it was one of those things to where I was really fortunate around to, to to be around these young ladies and what a group. Bryce, we talked about it. We went up there. We spent days with this group. They're so tight knit. They were so uh, engaged with each other. But Katie Robinson is just a special young lady. This is a young lady that's quiet, but man, does she pack a punch? She's just so good. And and you added Jenna Worley right behind that Skylar Q who might have had we thought kind of a sophomore itis but when you look at the numbers they actually weren't you know they were just in some really good tournaments so uh, I, I think that when you you look back on last year coach Harry took that next step he really did get there Katie Robinson went to the individual award we finished second in the team just there we're leading uh, after day two and it was just right there but he could turn the corner here going forward with some of the pieces he's got coming in golf is an interesting sport too because it's less about your top performers and it's more about just everybody kind of being good enough you know you only need the four scorers you got the fit that's there to kind of push the fourth person you take your four best and this is a team that felt like they should have been there they should have won uh, they should have come through uh, at the very end to to win the swack and it's a team that's going to challenge for it again this year you just kind of have to m improve that overall mix just as much as you do top end talent one of the newer sports on campus women's, t women's tennis uh chris wallet Brand new head coach last year came over from Embry Riddle. Uh, the, the team results wise had its struggles, but again, Chris Wallet is a veteran coach. He knows what he's doing. The program takes time to build up, and, and that's a team that I can see in the next couple of years challenging for swag titles, just kind of like golf is. These individual sports are are interesting, and and with Coach Wallet arriving on campus, it was a job that to a lot of tennis coaches with these egos who've come from places where they've they've won a lot as assistants, they look at a job like us trying to rebuild a program from scratch and say, I. I I can't take that job. I don't want my record to, to suffer as a coach because of, you know, having to go through that job to to rebuild a program like that. And, and Coach Wallet from Embry-Riddle, really successful program over there uh, at that level, said, give me the job. Let's do it. Let's roll with it. And it's it's a tough sport to, to recruit. It's a tough sport within this conference to recruit. Uh, but you can see that the effort is there. The, the arrow is pointed up. Um, I think you see that, again, kind of like we talk about with football, in, in the little things. I mean, they were named uh, ITA All-Academic uh, winner this past year. So they're taking care of business in the classroom and stuff that really matters for student athletes and when you take that and you then turn it into the the game on the court you can you can go really far with the program i have the opportunity to speak to chris almost every morning we talk about a lot of things and and this is one is how do you remain calm how do you why did you come over why did you take this position knowing bryce like you said your record's going to be affected because you have a program that was that was dropped for a year with COVID, and they ended up dropping the men's program but it's had success and he mentioned it he said well they've had success they've won titles there and they have with formerly with with head coaches like Trey Bogue and Tim Pleasant and then you have Val Valucci who came in and went back to Rhode Island he knows that you can win here and he said it's just going to take time and that he enjoys being here and I think that's the thing about Chris that makes it special he knows there's been players that have won 
conference accolades like NCAA Eiffel years ago. And this is one to where he sees the future. And I'll tell you, man, if there's somebody that's just happy to be here, loves the spirit of the place, embraces everything about Bethune-Cookman and knows that it's a marathon, not a sprint, it's Chris Wallet. Talk about track and field a little bit. It, this is pretty much the only program I don't interface with at all. So I'm going to let y'all take the reins on this, Bryce. <laughs> well, Coach Garen Jackson, you know, coming back uh, after being a member of the program himself uh, many years ago, he brings so much experience and so much knowledge of, of the university, of the program, and what it takes for a Wildcats track and field or cross country team to be successful. So it's just another another group, I think, that that knows where they need to be, and, and one that, with the departure of the coaching staff, uh, with, with some things that have gone on, had, had to kind of rebuild a lot, especially after that uh, SWAC title in cross country just a couple of years ago. Um, a lot of that team graduated off, a lot of veterans, uh, and so you kind of are starting from ground zero a little bit, but he's a guy who knows, knows what it means, a guy who was named to the Voorhees uh, Athletic mm -hmm. Hall of Fame mm -hmm. just in the last couple of weeks here. Um, he's got that pedigree. And I also think you want to give credit to uh, Courtney Walker, who's been Absolutely. with the program for a long time. And she is another one who has seen both sides of it. You know, she's seen the program at its highs. She's seen it at its lows. Uh, she's a great athlete herself. They have the pieces. They just have to get a couple of recruiting cycles in to build it back up. And what's a, a fun conference, I think, track and field wise, there's some good athletes that cool. come from here. We saw it even at the Olympic level this year. Absolutely. You, you talk about, again, I kind of give that old man vibe, you know, when I come into this, well, I have a lot of time to talk to so-and-so, you know, <laughs> I, I talked to Garen and he's been here. He's done that. He's won conference titles here under, under uh, coach Cooper when, when he was here and, and he's gone on back to his alma mater, South Carolina state. Garen knows what it takes to win. Garen knows what it takes to recruit Florida. He knows what it takes to recruit Bethune Cookman. He doesn't look at facilities and say, we don't have this. We don't have that. He looks and says, we have this, we have that. We're going to get this. And you just mentioned it, Courtney Walker, someone that has been around him. He's bringing in a new coach and Jalalisa, who ran for him here. He wants that stability and those people that don't look at any kind of outside uh, interference and say, oh, you guys don't have blah, blah, blah. No, they look at, we have this, though, and we've won with it. We're going to win with it, and we want people that have heart, people that have determination, and people that look at it and say, we have Olympic athletes that have come from bethune Cook, and most recently here with Monet Nichols and, and Sade. It, it's one of those things to where you're looking at the past, building on the future, and Garen is one of those people that can sell both and and I tell you what, the future's going to be bright with him. All right, let's go to the diamond. Talk baseball, 30 and 2 and 27 overall, 19 and 10 in the SWAC. Second straight season for Coach Hernandez with 30-plus wins, a big mark in, in college baseball. And again, kind of like women's basketball, early in the year, we were talking about that maybe this is the team of destiny, this is the team that could get over the hump, and it, it just didn't quite happen and you can blame scheduling you can blame the way the swag tournament works but it, in the end you got to win the games and it, it, another semifinals trip for the wildcats in the tournament but let's run through some of the stats um the non-conference wins fiu fgcu jacksonville unf stetson and miami the big one the win over the Hurricanes down in South Florida led the SWAC in ERA on the pitching side, second in fielding percentage by just .001 of a percentage point behind Florida A&M. Uh, but again, inconsistent offense, eighth in the SWAC in batting average, and runs scored. But th that's kind of the hallmark of Coach Hernandez's teams. They're going to pitch well, they're going to play defense, you're going to be in every game, and when the offense shows up, you're more than likely coming out with a win. Pitching and defense. I mean, every time we talk to Coach Hernandez, it's, it's leading with pitching and defense and last year they they did that they've done it every year uh, since joining the SWAC which is a little different than I think SWAC style of baseball especially out on the west um, it's just been a, a kind of a opposite power swinging the bat getting on base and just battling your way slugging through games that your pitchers aren't really there for and, and that top end pitching talent that coach Hernandez has been able to recruit with a guy like Tanner Bocabello uh, newcomer of the year in the SWAC first teamer Pablo Torres who on paper has some of the best stuff in the whole conference and, and really in college baseball, you know, he, he's he's really, really powerful in that back end. And several others who've, who've contributed really well. The, the pitching is, is outstanding. We know what we're getting every single night. But kind of similar to softball, it's been the bats that have kind of, when it's really, really come down to it, haven't always necessarily been there. Not to say they don't have guys, because Jose Gonzalez, right. Manny Soufrain had some really good <laughs> offensive seasons last year. But they just kind of haven't all clicked uh, when they've needed to. And so it, we, we go into another season where it kind of feels like unfinished business. Business. And, and I think that's a good spot for Coach Hernandez to be in. He gets fired up on that sort of stuff. Tanner Bocabello came in and, and did something that has always happened here. He added himself in a long line of Friday night guys that kind of came through the cracks. You know, you didn't really.
really wasn't highly recruited, wasn't highly sought out. He added himself to a Nolan Santos. He added himself to a Hiram Borgos. He added himself to a Gio Gautier. And, and these are in you know, RJ Rodriguez, a long line of Friday night guys that slipped through the cracks and ended up being so dominant and picking up accolades within the, the conference, whether it be the MIAC and now the swag of newcomer of the year, pitcher of the year, first team, all this, first team, all that. That is what wins games. You set the tone on that Friday night, especially, Bryce, you mentioned it. When you have teams in the West, well, now we'll talk about that later with no West East, but swinging for the fences, teams that are just, I'm going to go up and power it out. You need that guy that can come in and say, I'm going to give you seven and third, and maybe eight innings. You're not going to get but three or four hits, and you may get one clean hit on it. That's fine, but we're going to shut you down. I'm going to shove. I'm going to deal, and the bats have to come behind, behind it, and if they can come come alive behind that, I think this team is filthy, and, and last year, it did happen. It, it happened in a number of games to where the bats got hot at the right time but the pitching was always there pablo torres good grief that guy comes in shut the door you know just 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 close the door it's game over we could start packing up stuff mike you can go get your clothing ready you know that that's going to happen but i tell you what i love the pitching and I, I think that it's only going to get better i tell you i'm i'm excited and and those two guys we talk about torres and boca bella will will be back this right, year but in, right. a, in an ncaa world that is so terrified of the transfer portal now baseball here is one of the programs that you're most confident in that no matter how much turnover there is they're going to be great out of the gate because of that juco pipeline that coach hernandez has established here he's bringing in guys that that are experienced have won at some really great really 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 great programs here in the state of florida and beyond and so no matter how much turnover there is you're bringing in guys who are ready to play at the d1 level and who are ready to win at the d1 level so no matter how much lineup or or uh, rotation shuffling that there is, this is going to be a team that knows how to play ball. And Coach Hernandez named uh, Black College Nines Coach of the Year for the entirety of the HBCU world. And so the, the accolades are starting to flow in. And like some of the other programs, right, it's been a rocky couple of years with the COVID pause and a lot of coaching turnover and player turnover. This Coach Hernandez is someone who's had to build this program up and BCU baseball, historically, one of the most dominant teams on campus, won a ton of championships in the MEAC, went to regionals and almost super regionals and had been a nationally relevant program. And I think we're on the way back to that. And someone I want to highlight who's new to the program, Derek Cartaya, came in uh, as an assistant coach after uh, Jose Carballo left for Missouri as a hitting coach, infielding coach, and immediately made a mark on his program on this program every time i went to practice i would see him working with the hitters working with the middle infielders and the, the middle infield maybe the, the strongest in the SWAC uh defensively and and his imprint on the program immediate and, and he earned a much a much due uh promotion in this offseason been officially named recruiting coordinator uh for these wildcats so it speaks to not only his his work ethic and his preparedness when it comes to game planning and, and trying to navigate opposing pitching staffs but also to his relationships particularly in south florida a guy who comes from playing ball down at fiu and and we know coach hernandez already has such a gigantic footprint down in the hialeah down in south florida area so to be able to add another one down there what a wealth of baseball talent is down there. It bodes really well, again, for that pipeline that's continuing to be established here at BCU. Great coaching pipeline as well. You you look at some of the coaches, Mike, you just mentioned it with Jose Carballo going to Missouri. They upped their average this year in hitting because Carballo's out there working with hitters. Let's go one step before that. Keith, Keith Zuniga, it goes out to the University of Hawaii. He was under Johnny as well. And they go out there only lead the nation in ERA, you know, and are right there. I mean, that that's something that you can't you, you can't overlook that. So Hernandez not only can find good talent on the field, he can find good talent in the dugout as well. And, and you're talking about Cartaya, who comes from, like, and, and Bryce, you mentioned it, from an FIU program down there where they've had history. They're battling against University of Miami every year over there uh, for recruits and 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 kind of the, the talk of the town. Turtle Thomas had a fantastic run down there as head coach. And, and it, it's it's a program that has traditionally done very well. You got guys like Gary Whittles and Pablo Bermudez and those guys that are names. So FIU you has produced talent Cartai is one of those guys he knows what it takes to win from a kind of a school that says we might not have a lot but we've got this he's another line and, and i tell you what i'm looking forward to seeing what Cartai can bring all right before we sign off we're going to try to make this a weekly segment this is the fun topic could be bcu related most of the time probably not going to be bcu related just a, ch a chance to talk about either the wider sports world or, or something else going on but for this specific episode we've been talking about last season we're going to keep it in house what is your favorite bcu sports moment from the 2023-2024 season. It could be a game. It could be a play of a game. It could be something that happened outside of a game. But uh, what was your favorite moment of last season? I, I took a lot of the, the thought about this when we, we 
you know, pitched the question a couple of days ago. And it, you try to avoid recency bias. You know, we just come off baseball softball season just a couple of, of months ago. A lot has happened. I went all the way back to the very beginning. I mean, game one of the athletic calendar. I went back to the Memphis game for BCU football last year. And it was just such a, a weird off season. So much had gone on around the program. So many new faces, so much new. And we're down in Memphis and uh, against a program that, you know, one of those early season games, you don't expect a whole lot. And, and quickly down 10 nothing in the game uh, with just five minutes to go in, in, the, in the first period. And uh, Amari Jones, who's a guy who had stuck through the, the transition at coaching, who had uh, been there through a lot of it, a, a fun guy, great kid, uh, returns a 69-yard tip play interception pick six against Memphis when, when it all seemed like, oh, man, here we go. Like, this is it. And, and this is a big fella, big kid. If you haven't seen the play, you can find it on Twitter. Uh, it, was, it was so much fun. Uh, the guys are getting fired up everybody's watching him kind of stumble down the field and goes all the way down and and takes it to the house i mean just to watch everybody get fired up and it's like right out the gate like okay wow we got some excitement here and you know the, the wildcats didn't go on to win the game but we got to see then the media come out about him after the fact this was a game that was on espn so there were eyes on it people got to see it it was so much fun for him to watch him react to it and to to watch the team on his back and everybody else kind of get fired up about that it. one's up there for me and of course i uh, kind of selfishly uh barstool sports all their social media accounts shared uh, Daryl and I's call <laughs> of that. It kind of went a little yep. bit, but a little bit viral, yep. and uh, yeah, well, that was uh, a, a great moment. Harv, I hate to do this. We're we're talking about losses as being some of the great moments. It's another loss for me, yep. but it was an Alcorn basketball game for men. That was for me was the greatest moment. Not because of the game itself. Well, the game itself had something to do with it, but for another reason. Bryce, you mentioned all the off-field stuff that had happened with, with football and and a lot of the things that were going on around campus. You talk about some, some things that were away from athletics that were happening on the campus. The students needed a huge moment of this is Bethune Cookman. This is what we are. This is the excitement we bring. That Alcorn game showed everything about that. It showed the students being fired up, being happy, being together. It was something for me that for the first time since I'd come back, the students were engaged. The students were all on one accord and everybody in that gym was bleeding maroon and gold. Yeah, it ended up being a loss, but the atmosphere, ESPN, the ESPN announcers sitting next to us were like, wow, this is amazing. Like yep. they were having a great time. Everything involved with that game showed me this is the spirit of Bethune Cookman. And, and wow, I tell you, for me, that was the greatest sports moment. Just sitting back during a timeout, watching the DJ, watching the crowd. It was something to behold. It was the, it was, it was unbelievable. If you haven't been to a game in, in more gym, specifically you know, Saturday night men's basketball game, Game. There's nothing like it in college athletics when we pack out more gymnasium. Um, I kind of selfishly have two. One is baseball beating Miami and the kind of ripple effect around the college baseball world that that had. I'm like, oh, man, these guys beat Miami? They're legit now. And that kind of gave us like the momentum going right into conference play to, to do great things coming down the stretch of that season. But my favorite moment of the year, Deshaun Dyson, steal, circus shot, corner three, on on his own senior night to win the game against Alabama A&M. Uh, I don't think anything else tops that in the entire calendar year. And man, we got, that should have been Sports Center top 10, man. I submitted that thing 15 different ways. <laughs> we got stiffed so bad on not getting on ESPN that night. I stayed up till 2 or 3 a.m. watching the whole show. Like, ah, we're next. I know we're going to be there. And, and, and we didn't crack it, but man, it felt like one, especially being there in person. That'll do it for episode one of Hail Wildcats Radio. Thank you so much for listening. Hail Wildcats Radio was recorded at the 1380 WELE The Cat Studios in Daytona Beach, Florida. Producer Larry Steele. For Brian Harvey and Bryce Ranoski, I'm Michael Torillo. Thank you for listening to Hail Wildcats Radio. Make sure to follow the show on your favorite podcast app so you never miss a show. Subscribe to the Cat Eye Network on YouTube for more BCU sports content and share the show with Wildcat fans everywhere. We'll be back next week with the all-new Hail Wildcats Radio.